always excited for, for this every week. I hope you are too. We keep getting great guests on. This week, we've got John Windsor, the uh, founder of Open Assembly. He's got a really great background. I'm going to tell you all about in a minute. Uh, for those of you that are logging in for the first time to watch, or for those of you that log in every week, forgive me while I give you a quick reminder what we're all about. I think there's a lot of shows uh, out there, interview series that really focus on people's greatest successes. They focus on their triumphs. They focus on those moments where they get to kind of shout and give high fives and pat each other on the back or in some cases pat themselves on the back. What I love about O'Ship is it's a moment for entrepreneurs and leaders and business executives and, and some people with some really great journeys to take a moment and go, you know what, not every moment in my career was perfect. We call those moments oh shit moments. Welcome to this week's episode, and I look forward to introducing you to John in a moment. Oh shit. Great, we're back. Everyone meet John Windsor. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Freddie. It's so, it's so great to have you on. I, I always enjoy chatting with you. Uh, you know, John and I uh, met over the last, let's say, year or two, and we kept being told that we had to meet. I'd actually read about John many years ago uh, when he had his uh, company, Victor and Spoils, uh, which is a really, really innovative business model. I remember chatting about it with actually even last week's guest, uh, Juan Carlos Morales. Uh, you know, years ago, he's been on my radar. Now I'm thrilled we're on each other's radar and uh, yeah, a, lot, lot, a lot of common interests. So, you know, John and I share a passion uh, for the future of work. Uh, but I heard on a fun note, I heard uh, that you were actually uh, off on holiday last week. Was it in Wyoming? Yeah, Wyoming? exactly. In Wyoming. Uh, doing a little bit of rock climbing. Yeah, just exploring the mountains. You know, the, one of the things I love about Wyoming is you're not the biggest predator in the in the environment. So <laughs> you're walking through down through down timber and there's lots of moose and grizzly bears around and you always have to kind of stay super aware. Be be better to be afraid of that than COVID these days. That's for I, sure. Yeah, I totally agree. My dad, my dad and mom live up at the ranch and you know, I was kind of horrified when dad was going to make the trip. It's a 10 hour you know, drive up there. He's 84 and he's like, look, in Park County where our, where our ranch is near Cody, He's like, there's one COVID case and it, and it didn't go to the hospital. And there's one grizzly bear case and it did go to the hospital. And I, I, I like my luck. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. How, I, I got to ask, what are you talking about rock climbing? What are we talking about here? Like a 50 foot ascent, a, a thousand feet, 2000 feet? Whatever, I mean, what, what uh, you know, it's just, I, I think it's just moving on rock, right? It's like, it, you know, that's what I love to do. It depends, you know, it just depends on what it is. I'm mean, sometimes it's a trail on steep terrain. Sometimes, you know, you can look at like, you know, essentially hikes like Everest. I mean, Everest is essentially a hike with a rope, right? That's fixed, which is interesting because it's high and there's a lot of objective danger. I kind of like the more vertical stuff, rock that's, you know, I mean, it just, it, you know, I definitely have ADHD or ADD or whatever you want to call it. And so, you know, the idea of like having that kind of constant existential threat that I might die here if I don't focus <laughs> is, is really, is really an okay, awesome so thing. What, so on the, on the spirit of that, yeah. what's scarier, being an entrepreneur or rock climbing? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. I just like, you know, I mean, I've always liked scary stuff and, and I just think it really focuses me and gives me, me the ability to perform at a really high level. Oh, I, I mean, that. sometimes, you know, things can get way out of control and, and really scary. I've had, I've had a few situations like that. So. I like, I like uh, people who like uh, pushing boundaries. I think that's a, um, a very interesting leadership trait. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. See that, see that pattern there. Yeah, sometimes. Um, you know, re uh, reflecting on a little bit of your career, uh, you know, you and I uh, were both in the agency world in the kind of traditional sense at one point. Right. When you were over at Victor, uh, sorry, Chris Porter and Bogusky, I was right. I was doing my thing in Ike Million. Unfortunately, we never got to meet back then. Um, but then you tried something I think very disruptive with, with Victor and Spoils. Would you mind telling a, a, the audience a little bit about that and what you were thinking about and what the, even what year that was, just to kind of say, yeah, 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 a decade sure. now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's more than a decade. So, I mean, you know, you got to go back a few years, right? So I, I started this, this. Well, I bought this magazine out of bankruptcy called Women's Sports and Fitness. And we had a bunch of really athletic women that were our readers. And one of the things that was really crazy is that, you know, we knew that 
the market needed to get to these kind of early adoptive women athletes that kind of led the perceptions of the rest of the marketplace. But yet we knew that brands had a lot of money to spend, but by the time all these, you know, these things were intermediated agencies and marketing research companies and all the intermediaries, we got just a drip, you know, from, for the audience. And so when I sold women's sports and fitness to Condé Nast, I, I kind of thought about this idea of, you know, co-creation. I, I I coined that term back in a book called Beyond the Brand. And that's what early, early kind of open talent was. It was taking this group of early adoptive consumers and putting them at the top of the funnel through strategy and product innovation for companies. So that's kind of how we got our start. And then, and then Crispin, this guy, Alex Bogusky, was came to Boulder and we were riding bikes together. And I was going to sell my, sell my agency to, um, to Kantar, to, to WPP. And it was going bad. They were really financially oriented. And, you know, I had actually just a, as a side note, I had a really bad experience with an agency uh, before. And so I had, went at Radar Communications, which was the name of my strategy and research company. I, I kind of told everybody, I'll never work with another agency, only brand direct, right? Mm-hmm. They suck. They're, they're horrible. And and so anyway, I, I met Bogusky, we were riding and he, he was kind of, you know, we got to know each other pretty well. And he's like, well, let's merge companies. And I'm, and I'm like, dude, I, I hate ad agencies. I will never work for ad agency. I want to destroy ad agencies. They're stupid. And he looked at me, long silence. He was like, that's awesome. I want to do the same <laughs> thing. Let's do this. And so, and so we, we combined efforts and went on a, a quite a good run. So I think when we, we combined, there were 40 of them and there were 14 of us. And a couple of years later, there were 1,200 of us. And we, we'd won a bunch of business become... A, you know, creative agency a decade and when we did that we were doing a lot of work and we didn't have enough talent so we decided to do you know as creative agency a decade we decided to go crowdsource some creative on, on a platform called crowdspring which really blew up the industry and, and alex looked at me and said oh my god look at all the good talent that came to work on this project this the whole model of agencies is going to blow up and so i was super intrigued with that and, and then went to alex and i went to miles the doll at nbc and said we want to build an agency like this and and miles was like there's no way it will totally destroy our our financial you know like our proposition our business model and so i i went off and did that and alex decided he wanted to just stick in you know he was he was the big dog and getting paid the big bucks and decided he'd stay around nbc and didn't want to take the risk but uh yeah i mean the victors and spoils the concept was that you know, they're, they're in any agency, right? There are a few people that have great calling, great contacts that can actually do great creative curation from the rest of the agency. They can do great strategic curation. And my question was, well, that's the important part of an agency, right? The, the, the ability to work with the clients, come up with strategies, lead creative, but the rest should just be the world, right? It's like, why not, why not do that? And so we, we were, there were three of us in the garage and Stuart Elliott was nice enough to actually help us launch with an article in the New York Times, a half page article. And literally that night we had a thousand people join our crowd and Dish Network gave us $5 million worth of advertising. And we woke up in the morning and we were like, wow, we've got our real business. So it's kind of a, a crazy, <laughs> I love the best ride. positions are always the unintentional ones, I think on some level. I think that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was talking about today on the call, I think you heard, like that we were on together is like, one of the things I love about the entrepreneurial journey is like, to me, the goal of an entrepreneur is to really figure out what wants to happen in culture. And then, and then your job is just to help, help it happen. Right. Like how can you use your unique strengths to kind of push that along? And so, so yeah, victors and spoils was a crazy ride. And, you know, I didn't do it very long because I I think we were, we were operating for like uh, 16 or 17 months more because, you know, uh, this crazy cat, David Jones from a boss, kind of, I was at Ted and he kind of challenged me. He said, he said, Hey, yeah, you're great at throwing rocks at the glass houses of the, of the holding companies. But what happens if I give you the keys to Havas to let you reinvent that? Like, you know, why don't you come do that with me? And that, that seemed like as an entrepreneur who wants to change culture, that seemed like way too good of an opportunity to. to how, how hard, it. how hard was that in, out of interest? Cause I think there's so, there's so many incentives built into the agency model that especially when you're looking at a company that size that like de-incentivize collaboration and, and, yeah, yeah. and there's silos, you know, the silos and so on. Was it, was it possible? I'm sure you made an impact 
because that's just the kind of guy you are. But was that was it was that pretty hard, or is it is it still? Do you think it's possible to really shift a model like that? I, I don't even know. I mean, I mean, today I think it's easier, but back then, you know, I thought, you know, I'm always way too much of an optimist, and David was way too much of an optimist. I totally mis misunderstood the whole situation, and, and you know, people were calling me. I mean, th there was a pretty famous HBS case study on it, and one from France calls me the sorcerer's apprentice that I single-handedly was ruining the ad agency business, and you know, not, the COO at the time on video. These are all on video, right? Captured by Harvard. The, the COO said, "Oh yeah, that kind of open talent stuff, sort of like a hundred monkeys." You give you know 100 monkeys enough time to come up with something and so you can just tell right there it was not going to go anywhere and i was you know i was pretty i tried hard but i just didn't have the i feel really guilty by the way now because if you if you if you th that was the year when you know we were you were kind of leading the way at the death of the agency world now i feel like me and some of the other people like us are are we just kicking it on the way down <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly well that right <laughs> Well, exactly. We should have been dead a long time ago. I mean, I love people. And it's not, you know, to me, it's not about the people. The people, I love the people. It's just the the old model of kind of based on pre-production, having all these assets that you have to spend money on. It just doesn't work anymore. And so it has to be nimble and more agile. And, you know, that's kind of what I've always ushered into. So, so, so but I, I became the devil in the market for sure. So let's just kind of re like re, I want to reposition that just to kind of frame up what we're talking about for, for all the people listening. So, you know, the big disruptive idea was largely around, um, you know, big collaborative thinking, open networks, being able to pull talent in from wherever you needed to pull it in and solving big carry challenges. We didn't really talk, you know, crowdsourcing was, you know, the term you know, people were really using a ton at the time. Um, I think you guys were more than that, but um, you know, there, there was, that came out, you, you ran in, you know, what kind of problems or challenges did you run into? Because this is really one of the earlier cracks at people trying to use that kind of thinking for what I would argue is like a proper professional services organization. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, I, I would, I, you know, we were such early days and I, I'd say we were kind of really good at one, you know, being a one trip pony and lots of stunts. We did some great stuff. I think the hard thing was, is building a sustainable business model. So we did a lot of really crazy provocative stuff that, that won us a lot of, you know, adulation and, 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 you know, a lot of clients, but then We're sustaining crazy. that. Yeah, but sustaining that. I mean, you, you probably remember the Harley Davidson thing, right? It's like that's kind of what put our name on the on the market. It's just because you know when you have a company based on variable costs, you have no downside of doing crazy things. And so, essentially, what happened there was that uh, was that. And by, uh, and by the way, for anyone who's not you know doesn't know, you should you should quickly summarize the, that that work or remind people what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So so Harley um, Mark, who is the Oh, what's his what's his name? I can't I can't remember his last name right now. Anyway, the CMO at the time, Mark, um, was so great. He, he but he had, there was an article that went in the paper or sorry went in Ad Age and said that they were laying off of their their agency of thirty two years, Carmichael Lynch, and so you know I I actually just gone out the door to get some coffee from our office three do doors down. You know there's a coffee shop and our creative director at the time, my partner Evan Fry and I literally had a five minute you know conversation. We were like. That's going to be a drag. I mean, you know, Mark's going to get a lot of super great coffees and dinners and play golf and it'll be super fun. And he'll see some great creative work, but it's going to take months to do. Let's just take $10,000 of our own money and then put our thousand at the time. There were 7,000 people in our crowd, put our 7,000 people and start working today and put a brief out on our, our platform. Literally, we went back and did that in 10 minutes, put it up on online, put a video on it. Okay. And then I just actually, it was kind of back in the blog days and, and Twitter was really early. And so I just was like, hey, Mark, Mark Hans Ricker is his name. Mark, hey, Mark Hans, you know, have a great time with the agency. Super good dinners. You're going to get flown to New York. You're going to have a great time. And when you're doing that, I got, I got 7,000 people working on your business right now. Just give me a shout if you want to, you know, if you want to see good. any of the work, right? And literally, I hit Twitter, and ten minutes later, Mark was like, "Awesome idea! Love to see the work. Let's schedule a meeting next week." And of course, you know, the agency world was keeping an eye on us, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, and then two weeks later, we went and presented, you know, the work from seven thousand people, and we won the account, yeah. right? For, for the, yeah. For those who don't know, the agency model, which I love, on a side note, there's a huge amount of, of spec work that's done where people are spending insane amounts of money to try and win 
you know, business from brands like Harley Davidson, I personally find it super offensive. You know, my my you know painter who painted my house didn't come, and you know, I said I paint half the house, and I'll let you know if I'm feeling it. Like that doesn't happen, and you know, some guy you know works on my car. And then I'm like, do you do a bit of the car work and I'll let you know if I want you to do the rest of it. Like that doesn't happen in the industry. It's really un unfair. Um, you know, big agencies like uh, Sapient, you know, Razorfish and you know, Sapient when I was there, like it was not uncommon for us to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to pick up um, a big piece of work. So, you know, it really shows how disruptive that, that model was. Um, what I'd love to kind of do is jump forward you know, this you you clearly like this kind of open work formats, these new future yeah. work models, and now you've gone off. And I guess how many years has Open Assembly been around now? Uh, it's a third. It's a third year. Okay, so, so that's yeah. cool. So I'd, I'd actually uh, so around, you know, similar kind of number of years. We've been again, we've been in Chameleon Collective yeah. land. Um, so tell tell us tell me a bit about that and when you know what's the big vision there? I mean, so you know, there's a couple things, right? Is like like. I was I was uh, finished with Havas. David got laid, you know, got fired with a kind of a family spat at, at Havas, and uh, I knew my, kind of my time was limited, so I decided to kick out. And you know, um, it was it was in a time that was super unfortunate, you know, in my life. I mean, I you know, I I, I started a lot of businesses and been super lucky, and you know, my family and I we we have a house in Mexico and. You know, we we were surf, you know, we're dirtbag surfers and <laughs> lived on and off there. And and so, you know, we built a school in Mexico and and so and I was flying back and forth from Paris to do all this boss work. My wife Bridget spent the, you know, decided to take the kids down and go to school there in sixth and seventh grade. And she got super sick when she was when we were down there. She, she got really depressed and and then we came back here and, you know, it just became, she had bipolar and it became a real shit show for a couple of years in and out of facilities. And mm. yeah. And three years ago, she committed suicide. She shot herself. In the head. Sorry to hear that. It just, yeah. Thanks. It just was a, you know, as a guy who likes kind of epic things and adventures on the edge, it definitely was a, was one of those moments that you're like, wow, that's just, you know, it was, it was super, you know, terrifying to see, uh, person you've been married to for 35 years just go into such a dark space and just lost all control of, of herself and, mm -hmm. and then end up the way the way that you know the way that it did I mean it's one of those things right like the, the way I've contextualized it today is that you know those who bright who, who burn brightest sometimes burn shortest and Bridget certainly was that and, and so uh -huh. you know the end of uh you know, Havas was, it was probably a pretty good timing because I got a chance to like just dig in and help bridge out as much as I could and just rediscover. I've got a couple boys and, um, you know, really trying to help them think about what that meant and how to get beyond that. But I also started hanging out with the guys at Harvard and, you know, what happened was that uh, Kareem Lakani had built a new lab called the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard. And the lab is actually started as the NASA tournament lab, which kind of started the whole open innovation um, workflow at, at NASA. So they, you know, at the time they'd done four or 500 projects at NASA and really figured stuff out. And so it was really an honor to go in there as, as executive in residence and help them build the lab and be at Harvard. And, you know, I never, I'm a dirtbag surfer and climber. Like it's so strange for me to go hang out in the halls of Harvard business school, but, uh, but it's cool, man. It's like super fun. And, you know, it's been really, really awesome. So learned a lot there. And then essentially about a year and a half ago, and we had open assembly, but it was more like a little consulting gig, but about a year and a half ago, we had a, we had a conference at Harvard called the crowd Academy and the crowd Academy was just bringing together the best thinkers in this open talent space. And, and essentially what happened out of that is, is Diane Finkhausen used to be at GE and Steve Rader from NASA and ba you know, Balaji Bondili from Deloitte and myself, we all looked at each other and said, this is super cool. We didn't even know. It was like finding your long lost tribes, you know, tribe, right? All of a sudden you see somebody, you're like, holy crap, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. You know, we need to share experiences, all the pain I've had, you've had. So we came together as a group and we've been building kind of open assembly as it's much more than just a consulting, you know, consultancy. And, you know, now it's really more of a community we built this big community around future of work. And, you know, one of my big concerns this, in this, in this uh, period of my career is that, Hey, 42 million people are unemployed in the U S and 40% of those people 
uh, economists estimate that they might not go back to work because of technology advancements, because of, you know, categories of businesses going out of business. So if that means there's 19 million people without a prospect of a job, like we've got to really re re rethink what, what work is, right? Mm. And, and on top of that, one of the things that's really interesting to me is like, the work we do every day, the video calls, the, the, the amount of time we spend on our computer, the actual work product is all digital, yet the way we're organized, it's really organized mm -hmm. in an industrial age organization. It just doesn't go together. So to me, we've got to figure out new ways of employment. And one of the big issues is right now, for many companies, employment is pretty a binary thing, right? Either you're an employee or you're a vendor. And those are two different systems, the HR system or the procurement system. There's no middle ground. There's no, nobody inside the company is trying to define tasks they need to get done and then finding the best talent to do those tasks, whether it be for an hour, a day, or a year. Hmm. And that's kind of that flexible work schedule needs to be invented that's more aligned with kind of our digital economy. Well, one of the things I love about this, and, and full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm part of the Open Assembly community. I join the, the weekly calls and, and get to chat with uh, when I when I when I don't get it screwed up in my schedule anyway, uh, you know, I get to chat with all these other people that are like minded, but not totally like minded. And that's what's so interesting. What I mean by that is, you know, you're seeing people that are talking about the future work from, let's say, the big enterprise space. Right. And and maybe someone from the group is from HR and, and, and future work to them is about scalability and adding more people in and gig economy type stuff. And then. You know, another future work person um, in open assembly, maybe coming from NASA or something like that. I had a great chat today with, with a guy from NASA, which was just super interesting. Um, you know, uh, it could, could be about innovation and it could be about the way that you communicate and the way that you collaborate. Um, you know, uh, another group of people, and this is kind of stuff that I, I find myself thinking about is, you know, how, how, what's, what is this in terms of the way that you live, the way that you, that you work? It's maybe finding, you know, for some people that are uber talented with well-established networks, finding work isn't actually the hard part, uh, you know, and, and doing that work in a way that makes you happy, in a way that delivers quality, in a way that you don't feel that you have to give up a, a lot, because there are a lot of nice things about being part of a big company. Yeah, you know, sure. I, I, there's, there's scalability, there's community, there's infrastructure, there's stuff I like to refer to it. There's all this stuff that happens for you at a company that a lot of people, you know, uh, take for granted until they're not at a big company. Uh, and so, you know, having all that infrastructure there is really important. Um, and, and frankly, the other one that came up today that I think is, is uh, really interesting, uh, certainly certain to me anyway, in how do you facilitate trust when, you, when everything starts to become more of a network and it's more individuals and some of those things, people are unknown individuals, you know, people that you don't have a direct connection with. How do you say, this is someone I can invest in? Bigger companies have reputations, but individuals frequently don't. And I don't think any of us want to get rendered down to a five or 10 star rating. Um, and so what does that look like? Um, and so this is all the stuff that, you know, the open assembly, uh, crew has been chatting about, you know, when we, when you and I got connected again recently, I felt like I've been talking about this stuff and thinking about it, uh, you know, for whatever, three or four or five years now. And it was really neat to find a group of other people that I felt like had also been frankly looking for someone else to, to chat with about it. So, um, today was, they were actually talking about you guys are really, or so you guys are we, you, however you want to look at it, open yeah, assembly. We is now at a point where it's like defining a proper manifesto and a yeah, vision yeah. Of the future. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's super fun, man. I, I love it when you get to a point in a company or in any kind of idea in a movement, I guess we would call it. You know, I think a movement's that, a better term for it. I, I yeah, agree. yeah, yeah, no, totally. But you know, it's, you go from push to pull, right? And that's just happened in the last few weeks. So it, it was interesting to me that we had these private members only calls before COVID. And then as COVID happened, the, the group just kind of said, hey, let's start having these calls open and let's do them weekly and, you know, let's let everybody in and they become magical. And really was a kind of, I think today was a tipping point that woman, there's a woman that called me right before the call, just kind of out of the blue. I mean, she called me a few days ago. We had a half hour call set up, but she's the, she's the, um, the director or the you know, executive director of ADECO's foundation based on the future of work. So they do all these work. Globia ADECO is, you know, the largest employment company in the world. And so 
it was really amazing. And, you know, we just had a nice chat and obviously very different space. And, you know, cause they're, they're the most traditional of all traditional companies. And she, she came to the call today and she was like, Oh my God, I didn't even know this existed. This is unbelievable. I can see the future happen right now. And, you know, in these words, and it was super fun to see that, right. This alchemy of like, willing people from the past, willing to reinvent their companies or at least try. And then people that are really in the future and that, you know, how do we all come together and make a, a, the world a better place? Being really honest, uh, you know, with yourself, how many years forward do you think the COVID put this vision from being a reality? Like, do you think you would have been able to get all the people you've got today talking about this in the context and with the focus that you had last week, if it wasn't for COVID? Yeah, no, I totally, you know, I think COVID was the accelerator. I mean, it's pushed things five to 10 years into the future. I mean, it's so funny, right? Because before COVID, the biggest issue we had as an industry was trying to convince people that remote work was, you, know, you could trust people, mm. right? So all of a sudden that's totally off the, off the, ta- off the plate. And it's funny because I, you know, I, 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 I did this, that now it seems like such a quaint thing, right? I was given these speeches. I did one in Australia and one in Canada, right before COVID hit and it was called, you know, you will be disrupted. And, and I, and I, my point was like, no matter how easy it is, no matter how good you are, no matter where you are in life, you will be disrupted. And I obviously used the story about Bridget, but you know, I was in, the, in a very large avalanche in the nineties that, you know, the best, I mean, you know, 14 of the best skiers in the world with the most experience and, we, we still got on a big avalanche and, you know, 12, 14 of us were buried. And, you know, so my point always is like, doesn't matter how much skill you have and how much experience you have, crazy shit can happen. And, then, and now that just seems so quaint, right? Like, uh, yeah. Oh, shit. But before, but, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But before, before, like in December and January, it was sort of like, that'll never happen. Like, no way. I'll never happen to me. So. Yeah, we I, we actually we just put this white paper out called Into the Blue, uh, a guide to the post-pandemic world. It is a 58-page yeah. white paper that like a bunch wow. of the big thinkers in the company put together. We worked on it for months, um, and some of the chameleons that are focused on research um, focused on doing some proprietary research for us. And one of the stats that came out was, uh, and it was a good sample size, so meaningful enough to be uh, relevant. Um, was it 25% of, of everyone surveyed so they this is uh, you know, basically more obviously uh, blend of workers and so on. Um, uh, 25% of people expected that they would uh, permanently work from home. Uh, yeah, at this point. That's sure. a staggering number. It is. Uh, I, I even saw Google, you know, just uh, put out yesterday, you know, they're, they're like they're integrating all their tools, but it wasn't right. the tech side of how they'd integrated all their tools. What I thought was interesting was that the way they told the story in the announcement? Oh, what they say really about being able to work from home more effectively, ah, remotely. You know, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't like oh, it's integrated, so it's going to make you faster. It right. was a it was a work remotely story. Wow. I, thought was, I thought that was like really leading into it. And, and, yeah, uh, yeah, powerful totally. stuff. Yeah, no, I I think we forget it, right. It's like those of us that have done entrepreneurial things and are, don't don't really rely on foot traffic. It's kind of an existential thing. You don't really you know you kind of know it and it's there but i have a buddy who's a restaurateur and he has two restaurants right at the train station in denver and you know i saw him the other day and he said hey you know what's crazy about his business even though his restaurants are back open you see that the buildings right around his restaurants he, he had a quarter of a million people going past his restaurant every day to catch a train in denver right and 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 now he has four or five thousand people who go by that's it. And he's like, that's what's going to happen in the future. Like Deloitte's decided not to put anybody back in their building. Several of the other companies downtown just aren't going to do it. And so, you know, he's looking at, I mean, it's just, it, you know, the, somebody just cut the, the water spigot off, right? Cool. And it means a radical reinvention. So, because so uh, we're running on time, I want to ask you one final question. I had some great feedback and some nice comments, by the way. People impressed with your story and I've been watching oh, on social media. Um, if you had to give someone one bit of advice, they want to reinvent the way that they're working uh, at their company. Let's say, assume they're not already a virtual remote company. Yeah, yeah. One, one thing you'd say, try, try and do this. Yeah, I mean, it depends on where you are in the company and, and you know. Assume, but, they're, assume they're a leader. Assume they're, they're the le- a leader. Well, I, just, I mean, I just think, you know, I think that's life, right? I mean, what I found in the most, most deepest disruptions, whether it's trying to, 
you know, like you, you, you know, you go down an avalanche and you're you're buried with a hand and a face out, and you know, but your friends are all the way under the snow. Like this is the moment, right? Like every company is exactly in that position, and there's no other alternative. But you just got to move forward, right? You just got to do one step in front of the other and just do whatever it takes. And so I think in the context of reinventing thing, it's like there is no wrong answer right now. Just go try. Just yeah, fail. So my, my, my advice would have been be bold. Say yeah, exactly. Just right, get exactly. out there. Maybe that's a hopeless optimist in both of us, John. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I want to I want to thank you again for coming on our ship. I oh man, such a you. pleasure. Fun, Thanks fun so much. On camera, off camera. Always. Maybe one day we'll get to uh, do this uh, over drinks. Hopefully, I'd love that. Uh, I love that. I, have a, have a great day, John. Sorry, uh, Bob Thanks. Morris, I just, just chimed in with a question, but we're out, out of time, unfortunately. Uh, John, John's going to run uh, to another commitment. But uh, thanks, uh, John. See you later. Thank you, everyone that's tuned in. Thanks uh, so much. If you want to follow us on uh, social media, you can find us at Oship Show on Twitter. You can follow twitter.com forward slash chameleon. Follow us on Facebook, either Chameleon Collective or Oship. Follow us on YouTube. Or, frankly, follow me on uh, LinkedIn at linkedin.com. Uh, forward slash I am forward slash uh, Freddie Laker. Uh, and actually, I love engaging people on LinkedIn Live. Um, so it's a great place uh, to subscribe and follow. Thanks again, and stay tuned for next week's O Ship.